Welcome, friends, to another edition of Tiffin Cast. I'm your host, Sei Xu, and today I'm speaking with Lori Young, a young entrepreneur based in London. And he's written a book that I'm really excited about called On Being a Photographer. Laurie, thanks for joining me and welcome to the show. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Uh, Laurie, let's talk a little bit about uh, your background. Uh, what, what, what do you do exactly? I mean, I introduced you as an entrepreneur, but your background is so very and so wonderful. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. Okay, so um, my story starts probably at university um, where I studied physics and I was at Imperial College London for, I was actually there for a total of nearly nine years by the time I left. And I started off doing physics and then stayed on and switched to do a, a PhD in computing. I like to say it's to do with supercomputing, but that's probably over-exaggerating a little <laughs> bit and making it sound better than it was. Yeah. And it was while I was at university that I first got interested properly in photography. My father was a fashion photographer in the 60s and has since moved into interiors photography. And I grew up with my mother. It was a separate. Um, my parents separated when I was very young. Mm -hmm. And when I was at university, I thought, hey, this would be a cool chance to try and reconnect, reconnect with my father. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend who was very much into photography, so he introduced me to my first camera, and I spoke to my dad about it. And I discovered that I actually found the basics of photography really easy. So the stuff that a lot of beginners struggle with, exposure, aperture, and all of that stuff, it's all actually first-year physics. So from someone coming from a point of view of physics, that's quite easy to pick up. Indeed. Um, Indeed. I got involved with the photography club. I ended up running the photography club and started learning how the darkroom works and started teaching people how to use the darkroom, taking first-year students and giving them a background in photography, teaching them a lot of the exposure and the technical side of it. And then I had a really strange experience. I had a couple of months off, kind of between where one course finished and moving on to the next thing in my life. And I wanted to do a couple of photography courses. And I ended up on this absolutely fantastic course. It's called The Art of the Snapshot. And throughout the course, it was, I think it was, a, it was a fairly short course, five, maybe six um, sessions on the weekend, spread out over a few weeks. And the tutor took us into this idea of what is it you're trying to take a picture of? And he would give us these exercises where we'd have a theme and we'd have to go out and take a load of pictures, take them to the one hour lab and get them done up as prints and then lay them all out on a table and go through and pick which are the, which are the pictures that actually work with the theme, which are the pictures that don't and narrow mm -hmm. it down. And this really introduced me to the idea as photography, not as, a, not as a technical exercise, not as getting the right focus and choosing the right exposure and you know, framing something, but as a storytelling medium, as a communications medium, as a way of actually saying something. And the result was, for a few years, I just stopped taking any pictures. because so I realized I didn't actually have anything I wanted to say. I kind of thought, oh, wow. oh, oh God, now, now I understand this is about saying something. What do I say? Right. Uh, and so I took a, a break from photography. I, my, my professional career started off. Um, I work in IT building websites and bits of technology for businesses that kind of solve various problems within a business. And I have a passion for, for Latin American ballroom dancing. And so a few years later, I picked up a camera and I went to a, a ballroom dance competition. And I started taking some pictures and I realized, actually, now I'm photographing something I understand. I'm photographing something I'm passionate about, mm -hmm. and all of the, the knowledge I have on the technical side of it allowed me to, to solve some of the problems. You know, it's, a, it's a dark room, you're photographing people who are moving quickly in very uneven light. Um, because I knew enough about it, I knew how to, how to actually get those pictures. And this was something I'd done a while ago when I was first at university um, with the dance club. I'd done some pictures for it. Um, just the time off has allowed me to really kind of get some perspective and it really changed how I looked at it. And I realized I was quite good at this. Mm -hmm. And I started to get passionate about photography again. And I've been, that was about four years ago now. So I've been working hard, practicing, developing, doing lots of different types of photography and learning my skills. And I'm, I'm still really passionate about it. So recently I took the move and I went down from four to five days a week to four days a week in my job. And I'm now working on building a couple of companies which are going to be providing online services to help photographers. Oh, wonderful! Can you talk about uh, can you can you talk about them at all, or, or one of them? Yeah, so so I can talk about one of them. Um, it's called Frozen Event, and it start, started off actually from the dance world. 
um, there was a lot of photographers at these dance competitions. They're all taking pictures. And when I looked at how they're trying to sell their pictures, it's actually quite, quite challenging to buy one of their pictures. You go and they have a website, and it's not a particularly easy website to navigate. It's quite difficult to find the picture you want. And then when you do find it, more often than not, you have to phone the photographer and I'll try and explain over the phone which picture it is you'd like to buy. Yeah, it's the one on, on page 17, three down from the top. It's a picture of a girl in a pink dress. Can I buy that? Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is just not the, not the ideal way to do it. Sure. And so I've built up this website which allows photographers to upload their pictures from these competitions and then allows people to go onto the website and buy the pictures. And then they get a digital copy of it. And the next step now is I'm going to expand that. So currently it's targeted very much at photographers were photographing Latin American ballroom dancing. Oh, very wow. Okay. okay. I'm going to expand that. Okay. So it's essentially a, a proofing site, essentially a, a site where photographers can post pictures and interested parties can go in and buy images and download images and things like that. Exactly. Okay. And there's a few kind of dynamics about the fact that it's an event which changed some of the, some of the workflow and so it's customized for that. Oh, I see. Okay. Wow, interesting. So it's a, it's a niche... Uh, market for you in a way that it, it only uh, it helps photographers who are photographing events rather than you know portraits and things like that. Got exactly, Got gotcha. it. perfect. Great. Um, you've written a book. Uh, I have indeed. Uh, you've written a sp not just one book. You've written a book before, right? Several books. Uh, uh, this is the first book book I've written. Book book. Okay. All right. I've, I had to write a, a PhD thesis. Which oh, we won't qualify that as a book. Read that. Yeah, yeah. Well, this this is this book uh, you've written, uh, you know, which I've downloaded and I've started reading, is very interesting in that you're the first person that I know of that, as a photographer, uh, has approached the idea of intent uh, with with the making of images. Tell us a little bit about how you got started and why you got started with this idea. Okay. Um, the idea kind of gradually grew on me over time. I could say the, the first seeds of it was this photography course I did, where we was, I was introduced to this idea of how do you assess if a photo is good or bad when you've got no, 100 pictures? And the answer was, well, which one most um, illustrates the idea you're trying to make? I was also interest, influenced a lot by my professional career. So I work in the world of building software for companies. And there's a challenge there in that you have to really know what that piece of software is trying to do. Mm -hmm. You have to understand what the business is trying to do and how the software fits into it and what's the, what's the goal, what's the real thing that the software is trying to do. I also then got influenced by a lot of thinking in the business community that has a similar approach to thinking about business. There's a fantastic um, TED talk, it's actually a TEDx talk, by a guy called Simon Sinek, mm -hmm. where he talks about this idea of start with why. Always explain why you're doing something. And so I was influenced by this fairly similar idea, or a fairly similar collection of ideas from several different viewpoints. And it gradually dawned on me that I haven't seen anything about this in the photography world. And you know, occasionally you'll see a blog post, someone kind of hints at it, but nothing that's clearly setting out and saying, this is a core idea, or this should be a core idea. And to my mind, it was fairly obvious that this should be a core idea. And so I thought, well, I'm getting increasingly passionate about this concept. I'm starting to, to bore my friends when I talk about it over, over drinks. So clearly, I need to write a book and, and get it out there and see if, see if the rest of the community agrees with me or see if they think I'm barking up the wrong tree. Right. Uh, and you've, you've, you've sort of fleshed it all out into this book uh, called Being a Photographer. I kept call, calling it On Being a Photographer, but it's just... Yeah. Being it's a an photographer. interesting point, by the way. There's, there is a book called On Being a Photographer. Which, which is also by uh, a British uh, photographer, yeah. right? And that's, I, did, I didn't choose the name to coincide with it, but I can heartily recommend that book. It's another fantastic book that it, I think everyone should go and read. Uh, uh, mine, is, mine is completely like worn out because I've, I've read it probably at least three or four times because <laughs> it was so, so filled with so much useful information even back then. It was written yeah. by... Uh, a, a photojournalist or a documentary photographer, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm trying to remember the, the gentleman's name. Um, and he I'm was, afraid it temporarily escapes me. I, I, I'll, I'll find it and I'll post a link to it uh, in, this, in this blog post uh, when this uh, video gets published. But it's also a, a phenomenal book in, made, in ways that made, just made me think about what I was doing and why. Um, the book you've written uh, is 
is is really meant for whom? Who is it for? So I was thinking to target for the people who have, who have gone out and bought a camera and are really passionate about photography and kind of want to make the leap from this is a hobby I dabble with sometimes to this is a part of my identity. Mm -hmm. And I think it's quite distinct from the amateur professional split. Um, you know, professionals are taking photography to taking photos, doing photography as part of their income. And that doesn't necessarily equate to um, the way that an amateur approaches it. And I think that, that the amateur versus professional split is, is a different subject. It's not one I'm trying to, <laughs> to approach. I'm trying to approach the, uh, I've got a camera and I take some pictures approach versus the, I'm actually trying to do something with my photography approach. And an analogy I sometimes use is the problem that a lot of um, professional photographers face, particularly the wedding photographers, where the, the couple that's getting married thinks, oh, no, some relative has got a camera. He can take the pictures. And just because they've got a camera, it doesn't mean they're a photographer. And as I started thinking along that lines, I said, OK, well, what, what is the difference between a photographer and someone who has a camera? You know, it's not whether or not they earn money at it, because some of the amateur photographers out there are fantastic. You look at their work and you just go, your jaw drops in amazement and you think, this is amazing. Now, you mentioned, you mentioned 500 pixels and Flickr and other exactly. sites that have these amazing photographs and you just wonder, who, who are these people, right? You know? Yeah, exactly. And some of, them, some of them are professionals, but a lot of them are just amateurs who love doing this, who really want to, mm -hmm. to create art or to convey an emotion or if there's a whole different series of intents that someone could have, but they, they've kind of got it clear. It's clear for them what they're doing with mm -hmm. it and why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. In the book, you, early on in the book, you say, and I'm reading from your book right now, is you say, to be a photographer, you need to understand intent. Yes. I mean, that's a, that, that, that I, I've highlighted it because, <laughs> because it is like the, the very essence of what I do and why I do it, but I don't understand why there's just billions and billions of, images posted to Facebook or, or Instagram where it's just stuff. And I'm just wondering, what's the point of that, right? So, exactly. So is this book trying to explain or at least guide people to go and think a little bit more about why they're hitting the shutter and, and making that image? It's, I actually think it's a fraction earlier in the workflow than that. So I think normally by the time you've kind of got the camera up to your eye and you're about to press a shutter, it's often a little bit too late. The, at that point, unless it's like, wow, this is just an amazing scene and I have to show people back home and I'm going to get my camera out and record it, mm -hmm. that's, that's fine. But if you're trying to, I don't know, tell the story of your family, for example, then you should probably be thinking about that before you even take the camera out of the bag. There's a, a saying in, in filmmaking and videography that it's substantially more expensive to fix mistakes later. You know, so if you have to, if you realize at the end of post-production that some of the dialogue is wrong, that's really expensive because you've got to go right back to the script writing and often right. reshoot it. And it's kind of a similar thing here. You have to, the earlier on you know the intent, the easier it's going to be throughout the rest of the process. But the, 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 I, I, get, I get what you're saying, but I feel like uh, most people don't think like, okay, as a videographer, I'm going to have to go back and redo this. You know, for them, it's a, it's a it's a quick it's a quick hit. It's a quick look at the back of their cameras. They're they're happy with good enough, and they move on to the next thing. And and I don't know whether they will actually consider at any time the ramifications of oh, I wish I had thought about what I was doing. You know, the, the the ramifications are not as great for most people, I think, and that's probably why there's such a incredible glut of images that just don't say anything. Exactly. And one of the things that's come out of the digital revolution, the switch from film to digital, is it's so easy to do that. Right. You don't have to put any money on the table. You know, right. Back in the film days, it was about £10 for a roll of film, if you include the developing, probably about $10 in the States. And every time you took a picture, there was a financial cost to it. So I think it encouraged people to think a little bit more deeply about what they were picturing. And if I could have kind of one goal, one intent, if you will, for my book, sure. I would like it to increase the number of photographers who actually do think that through. I would love it to, even if it's a small change, to have a slightly um, larger percentage of photos where you actually look at it and you think, you know what, I know what this guy's saying. 
And I take some inspiration from here from people like um, Sebastian Salgado, who did this Genesis project recently. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yes. And he's got this intent is to just take a portrait of what nature looks like in its most abstract sense. So he's traveled the entire planet and he's photographed animals and landscapes. And it's, what he's saying is, I want to communicate to the rest of the world what I think nature is. It's an absolutely fantastic exhibition. If, yeah. it's, if anyone's got it, uh, the traveling version of it coming near them, I'd heartily recommend seeing it and, and leaving about four hours because it's, it's a big exhibition and it's, it needs the time. He usually prints really large too, right? And yeah. so, I mean, he, he, I've seen some of his work and it's astounding. I haven't seen this work other than the book, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, what would you recommend for somebody who's starting out, uh, who has that camera and who's starting to think, I am a photographer now. What is it that you can tell that person, he or she, in terms of approaching photography? Would you? Okay. I mean, obviously the, the prescription would be here, read my book, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That, that would be a good first step. But I feel like, you know, what, is, what else could we be doing or saying or, or helping photographers make that decision in, in terms of getting it? Because I get asked a lot, what camera do I get? What, cam what, 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 what lens do you recommend? And I, I'm, I'm looking at them going, how are you going to use these pictures? What you, who is it for? I mean, those kinds of questions never come up in people's minds. And I feel like you almost need to like, create a PDF like, with a hit list of like, go through these questions first before clicking the shutter, you know? Absolutely. So the first thing, so if someone comes to me and says, oh, I'm, I'm, I really want to take up photography. Right. What do you advise? I'll spend a couple of minutes checking if there's anything they're passionate about. Because if there's, say they're trying to do sports photography. Right. At that point, you can't go out and buy a really low-end SLR because you need the, the really fast focus. So just check for a couple of things like that. But, but once that's dealt with and over with, I, would, I generally recommend them two things. The first is really get an understanding for what you personally appreciate in a picture. Because one of the things that's really, really important, I think this has to be an intent for every photographer across every picture they ever take, is they have to like their work. They have to create something that they're proud of. And... That's very much like level zero for me. If, if as a photographer you're taking work that you don't enjoy, then you're not going to enjoy the experience. You're going to find it miserable. So that's, that's kind of like a non-negotiable for me. Beyond that, I'd say start trying to actually say something. And the typical example I use is go and take some pictures of a family gathering and just try and create some pictures where everyone in the family is going to look at it and say, oh, no, that's really nice. You've really brought back to me the memories of what it was to be there. Or if someone couldn't be at, say, a Christmas or a, or a Thanksgiving, oh, I really know what it would have been like had I been able to be there. I really feel that I was there. And what you're doing here is trying to, to use the photography to help um, strengthen the family connections. That's, that's one, of I think, of the most approachable examples of intent because... Everyone has either a family or a close friends or a close social group that they can, they can do this with. And I think it's really easy. It gives you the experience. And it's, it's a very safe environment because if you try it and it doesn't work out, maybe, the, maybe you haven't yet developed your style of storytelling, maybe you haven't managed to capture these pictures, there's no consequences, which is, is great because there's nothing more detrimental to trying to learn something than failing in a painful and dangerous way. Indeed. Indeed. What do you recommend uh, on the flip side for a professional who has already been photographing for quite some time and has sort of gotten into a rut, you know, has sort of, sort of gotten into this, uh, this habit of simply clicking the butter button and just saying, oh, shit, I, I, I've got a picture, I'm done, you know? What is it that you can tell her or him to perhaps re-inspire them into, into, uh, into embracing photography all over again? So, yeah, fantastic question. And the, the challenge a professional faces is they, they really understand their workflow and their style. And so say it's, a, say it's a wedding photographer and they know how they photograph a wedding and they're going off to a wedding. There's very little room for experimentation because they can't get it wrong. It's not a particularly safe to fail environment. So I would suggest kind of two things is allow yourself 5% of the time, maybe the last few minutes or throughout the day, depending on the structure, to try and do something experimental. And because it's such a small amount of time, if it, if it doesn't work, then there's no, it doesn't matter. You know, you've, you've tried, you've pushed your boundaries. 
And the other example is practice, practice and practice, and do that in your spare time. I had a, a really interesting interaction recently. I, met, um, I went to a photography meetup here in London, and I met this guy who had just moved over from India. He's a professional photographer who had done some work with Bollywood. He was, had showed me some of his pictures, and they were really first class and stunning. And he said, he, professionally speaking, he doesn't shoot on a, that huge much of a regular basis. You know, he does these big jobs and then has some gaps in between. But he takes photos every single day. And this event we were at, it was just you know, wandering around somewhere in London trying to do some street photography. And he said, from his point of view, this is his equivalent of going to the gym. It's his equivalent of working out and practicing and trying out different things. So my advice to the professional would be, try and push yourself for something that you wouldn't necessarily try and consider safe while you're on a, on a job, but also experiment and practice on the days you're not on a job. Even if it's 10 minutes, walking around the block where you live, looking at the things you've seen every day, just try and get some different pictures, because that's, that's where learning comes from. That's a phenomenal advice, uh, Laurie. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, all that you're, you've done for the photo community, and I'm looking forward to introducing the book here to my friends on Tiffin Box. Laurie Young uh, is a photographer, a physicist, a ballroom dancer, an entrepreneur based in London, and he has just written a book called Being a Photographer, and I've just spoken with him about his intent on the book. <laughs> Thanks, Laurie. Appreciate your time again. I'll thank you very much for having uh, me. I'll see you another time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.